Well, to stand up to pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name because of the Bible story today. Thank you, Lord, for the purpose of gathering us together. And we pray that that purpose you'll fulfill in Jesus' name. That will not be people that are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But that, Lord, you bring our heart, our minds, our will, everything within us into the knowledge of your truth in Jesus' name. And the purpose of bringing us to the Bible study, you fulfill in our lives in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. Let the study of your word draw us closer nearer unto you so that we'll be in the center of your will every time in jesus name we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray amen, amen. thank you very much you can see that we come back to our bible study today once again we've been in the matthew series and that is the sermon on the mount we've been looking at matthew chapter 5 chapter 6 and very soon we'll be going to chapter 7. But today we're still in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at an important part of scripture. Look at your Bible, Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at verses 22 and 23. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore then I be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. These are verses that many people do not understand. And we need to understand what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying. Before I go into the thorough explanation, exposition of those verses, we want to ask ourselves, why do we have the word of God? Why do we read the word of God? Why do we study the word of God? Why do we endeavor to know the word of God? Why do we try to interpret and apply the word of God? For what reason do we come to the Bible study? If you don't know the reason why you're doing something, you'll not do it well. But when you know the reason why you do what you do, then you'll be able to know how to get that thing done acceptably. And then your coming to the Bible study will be profitable, will be very useful. Look at John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. The Lord wants us to be free. Free from sin. Free from Satan. And free from all the things that bind men. Free morally. Free spiritually. And free in every way. So we can be released to serve the Lord without any bondage. Without any hindrance. That's the reason why we know the truth. That's the reason why we learn the truth. That's the reason why we study. Study the truth. Ye shall know the truth. And it's the truth that shall make you free. Every time you come at that, at the base, at the, at the back of your mind, that you're coming to study. And you're coming to study so that the truth that you hear, the truth that you learn, the truth that you know, and the truth that you apply, the truth that you pray on, will make you free. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 28. Who we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom. The preacher should, and the teacher should, endeavor to teach in wisdom. Not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the Spirit of God. And the reason why the teacher endeavors to do that, why the learners also, why they listen. Look at this, it says when we're preaching, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of study. 
When you come to the study, you want to discover the inconsistencies of your life, the frailties of your life, the infirmities of your life, the imperfections of your life, and then that the study, the learning of the word of God will present you perfect before the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4. The reason why we study the Bible, we study the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Was well, he giving us all these ministries? Was well, he giving us the teachers of the word? The pastors that lead us, that shepherd us, the guide us. He tells us in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Number one is to turn sinners to become saints. And then those saints, those disciples, those followers of Christ, then perfecting them, cleansing them, watching over their lives, making them the people they ought to be for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. You'll not be strong enough to do the ministry if you don't learn the word. And so you become from a sinner to a saint. And from a saint to a Christian worker. From a Christian worker to a minister. And you go through all those processes because of the learning of the word. And then it says for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why, why do we learn the scriptures? To edify, to build up. The body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Is to bring those who are far away near. Those who are very near. Bring them to the center. And it says all the saints then. They come to the unity of the faith. To the knowledge of the son of God. And then it says unto the perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In verse 14. That henceforth. Will be no more children tossed to and fro. That's what we study to become solid and stable and steadfast. That you are not like somebody on the waves in the oceans of the world, tossed here and there, not knowing what to believe, not knowing what to stand on. But then you study the word, and it says in that verse 14 that who is for. Be no more children, childish people, ignorant people, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Why do we come to the Bible study? What do we learn? Why do we take all this diligence to go verse after verse and then we study the word of God in a very diligent and systematic way. It says so that you can be approved unto God. So that your life inside out your life within and without, your life in the private, your life in the public, your life in the church, and your life in the community will be approved of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, so that you yourself will come to the position, to the situation. You'll be able to divide the word of truth. You'll be able to interpret the word of truth to other people. We study then so that sinners can be saved. We study then so that those who are saved will become saints. We study then so that those who are saints will become perfected. We study so that they can be stable and stable first walking with the lord and going on with the lord until we see him face to face we study so that the study will bring us out of the world and lead us in the pilgrimage in our journey and lead us into heaven eventually i pray that this purpose of study will be fulfilled in your life we're coming back to matthew chapter 6 now we come to this matthew chapter 6 this is a parable with then the sermon on the mount you see that jesus used figures of speech and he used metaphors he used illustration that's what i call it a parable see the parable see the metaphor see the figures of speech that he used the light of the body is the eye it's looking at the body and then he's looking at the eyes. He's looking at the whole body. And then he's saying, you know, the light to the whole body. 
is the eye. You understand that? If you closed your eyes and your eyes are not functioning, there's no light. And therefore, the body cannot function. The legs cannot move. The energy is there. The bones are there. But the legs cannot go anywhere because you cannot see. If you close your eyes and there is no light, the hands cannot work. The hands cannot do this and that. If you close your eyes, you cannot drive your car. And so, the light of the body and the things that make the body to function, the body to do what it ought to do, is the eye. To read, you need your eyes. To, to do any work, any profession you have, to be able to do that work, no matter what you know, you need your eyes, you need the light of the eyes, so that that will give light to all your body and to all the members of the body. Then you'll be able to set yourself in motion. In the right direction. That's what the Lord is saying. And then it says, If therefore then I be single. That's an old English word for sound, healthy, wholesome. If your eye be wholesome, if your eye be sound, if your eye be in good health, that's what he's saying. Then he says, your whole body will be full of light. Your whole body will be full of light. There will be light for the hands to work. And the light for the legs to move. And the light for every part of the body to function well. That's what he's saying. But he says, but if thine eye be evil. That means it's not sound. It does not see well. It's dim. It's darkened. It's diseased. It says, if your eye be evil, and therefore it's dim or darkened or diseased, and it's not seeing well, then your whole body will be full of darkness. It says, it doesn't matter the intelligence you have if you don't have eyes to see. You'll not be able to use that intelligence well. It doesn't matter the learning you have, the ability you have, the capabilities you have. If you don't have eyes to see, it says, then your whole body will be full of darkness and the members of the body will not be able to function well. If therefore the light that is in thee, if therefore the light that is in thee, and those, the light is only through the eyes. And if those eyes, if they are darkened and dimmed, and if there is no light in them, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkened, how great is that? darkness it's like you are walking in the night without any light how much can you do it's like you're moving through this life and all the pitfall the pitfalls are there and the rocks are there and all the ditches are there the difficulties are there the dangers are there and you don't have any light to see he said how great is that darkness it kind of paralyzes you it immobilizes you you cannot do anything because of the darkness that you have that's what the lord is saying and then the lord now wants to break everything down to us we're dividing the message to three parts number one proper meaning the proper meaning of symbolic eye and body what does it mean the eye the body because if it's a parable metaphor figure of speech it must have meaning it's when you know the real meaning you'll be able to know the interpretation the proper meaning of symbolic eye and body number two pure motives of single-minded believers focused believers Believers whose hearts are fixed on the right thing. Single-minded believers. This one thing I do. A purposeful believer. A focused believer. Single-minded. And he knows this is the direction to go. And he's going in that direction. And it's in the center of the will of God. Point number three. We have perverted minds with self-centered behavior. Perverted minds. Their hearts are darkened. Their minds are darkened. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who believe not. And because of that darkness and blindness, they are not able to live right. They are perverted and they have this uh, kind of stained, soiled, immoral perception. And because of that, they are not able to do right. Let's come back to number one, proper meaning of symbolic eye and body. And you notice in that passage I read to you, Matthew chapter 6, 
reading verses 22 and 23, how the Lord mentions the I, the I, the I, three times. And then he mentions the body, the body, the body, three times. And then he puts every seed together and tells us the conclusion of what is teaching us. Come back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. The body mentioned two times there. I mentioned two times there. Verse 23. If thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. The eye and the body are used as metaphors of, spe of figures of speech. What light is to the world, the eye is to the body. Imagine you wake up one morning and there's no light. The sun does not shine. Everything is dark. It happened at the time when God was a kind of waging war, having controversy with the Egyptians. And for three days, there was great darkness. And then the Bible says the Egyptians could not go anywhere. They could not move from one place to the other because of that thick, terrible darkness. And that's what the Lord is telling us with the sun shines its light to the world and then our eyes will catch the rays of the sun as the sun is shining on the world then our eyes is also getting its own radiance its own light so it can give light to the rest of the body without the light of the sun there will be total darkness and positive productive activities on earth will be impossible the activities of the body are directed according to the light which is received through the eye. That's what the Lord is saying. He says when you receive the light, then your actions will be all right. What's the Lord telling us then? The body represents the sum total of all our actions and activities. What the hands do, what the legs do, what the mouth says, what the ear hears, what the mind thinks, what the, what the heart loves. You put everything together, all those actions and activities of the body, they are referred to as the body here. And then it says that the light that makes that possible, the members of the body produce actions, the actions of the brain. The actions of the mind, the actions of the tongue, the actions of the legs, and the actions of the, of the hands all result into our life. Your life. Now that's all. It's the members of your body that produce those actions. And the sum total of everything is referred to as your body. These actions are possible when we have the light of day. The eye receives the light, and through that light, the activities of the body are directed. What really directs are moral and spiritual actions. Think about that. Our moral actions. So what directs them? Now we're moving away from the physical, and we're moving to the spiritual. We're moving to the interpretation. Is it the eye here that actually directs whether you do right or do wrong in the physical? Yes. But in the spiritual, it's your heart. What light? Are we talking about the light of the sun? Is it the light of the sun that makes us live a righteous? No. It's the light of the world. The light of the world. He, Christ, is the son of righteousness. And he is the word personified. And it is the word that sheds light across your pathway. And it is your heart, your understanding, your mind, your conscience that makes you to see the light of the word of God. And when you think about this the interpretation, that's what Jesus is saying. You need the son. And it is the son that shows you the light. Look at Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. It says the son of righteousness will arise. And then he tells us because of that son of righteousness, 
giving us the light, then you're able to go forth in the presence of the Lord. Look at uh, Psalm 119, Psalm 119, and see the light we're talking about now, the application. In Psalm 119, we're reading from one, uh, verse 105, your, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That, that's it, that's it. You have the word of God and it sheds light. What makes you to understand that word of God is your heart. You understand it. That's why the Bible, the Bible puts everything together in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, let's look at verse 18. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You see that the eyes of your understanding... The sun of righteousness is shining. He is the word personified. And then the word of God, the reaching word is shared abroad. And then you see the light of the word. It's the word of God that makes you to know this is the way to go. Walk ye there in this is the way to live. Live like that. This is the way to please God. It's the word of God that gives you light in those areas. And it's your heart that gets the understanding. Now I know. Yes, I see. Now I understand. This is the will of God. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened in that verse 18 that she may know. The eyes are enlightened that she may know the light of the body is the eye. And if your eye be sound, if your eye be single, if your eye be focused, if your eyes have clear vision, then it will give light to the whole body. And then it says that she may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's what the Lord is actually teaching us. He tells us in Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27. Here it says, the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. Think about that. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. What's the candle? The candle is what you have there. That, you know, that's what they used in the old days. They have all these electric bulbs and all these present lamps. All they had was a candle. But you see, the candle did not have any light of its own. Somebody has to come and bring light. And then lighting of that candle. And then there'll be light. There'll be light. And we didn't have the light. But but God has the light of the word. And we, in our spirit, in our heart, it is our heart, it is our mind, it is our spirit that is a candle of the Lord. And in that verse 27, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Can you see that? The light, the word that he gives us. And it makes us to understand that in our heart. In our heart. And that's why it's telling us when it says the light of the body is the eye. That means the body now all our actions, all our activities, our behavior, our moral leanings, everything we do dictated by what our heart understands. The eye of your understanding enlightened. It tells us in Psalm 19, Psalm 19, let's look at verse 8. Psalm 19, we're looking at verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandments of the Lord, pure. And those commandments of the Lord enlightening the eyes. That's the eye of our understanding. When you read the word of God, it gives you wisdom. Gives you understanding. And then you know this is the thing to do. And this is the way to go. That's why when we preach the word, I didn't know that before. Now I know. That's your 
eye of understanding being enlightened. I didn't see that before. Now I see the eye of your understanding being enlightened. For that's the ministry of the preacher of the word. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We're looking at verse 17 and verse 18. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles. Unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. To open their eyes. Those Gentiles, they're in darkness. They do not have the truth of the gospel. They do not have the word of the Lord. But I'm sending you to them so that you can open their eyes. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. And that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 28 from verse 25. Acts 28 verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves. They departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well, speak the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet. Unto, the, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto these people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, I shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of these people is waxed gross. He said, You will hear, but not understand. You will see, you will not perceive. Then it brings everything to the heart. They hear, they see, but they don't understand. Then he says, that's because the heart of these people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That's the darkness. Their eyes they have closed. So the word of God does not penetrate into their heart. And then it says, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. The Lord then is talking to us about the condition of the heart. The condition of the understanding. The condition of the affection in the heart. The intention in the heart. The motive that you have in your heart, in your life. It is that heart or the affection. That mind or the will. And that spirit inside with the motive, the intention, the goal, the desires. If those things are pure, your mind is pure, your heart is pure, your spirit is pure, your understanding is enlightened, your conscience is cleansed, and your affection is centered on only the will of God and the mind of God. Then your whole body will be full of light. And everything you do will be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us. Thine eyes shall be single. The word single, he have told it means sound, wholesome, healthy. The single eye, the sound eye. It refers to purity of intention, selflessness in our motives. With purity of motive and affection. Our actions of the body. Of our activities will be full of light. With selfishness in our motive. And in sincerity in our intention. We are termed to have an evil eye. And our actions will be the works of darkness. It's talking about how many pure conscience. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, reading verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and man. Herein do I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense. You understand? The word of God is opened. The word of God is read. And the word of God is revealed. That enlightens your conscience and points out this is right or that is wrong. With the understanding of the conscience and with the understanding of your spirit and your mind, you are able to determine this is the right way. And then with the grace you now have from the sight of the Lord, you are able to walk in the right direction. We come to point number two. Point number two is talking about pure motives of single minded 
believers, pure motives of single-minded believers. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're reading from verse 22 again. Already we have got the meaning, the interpretation of the eye. The meaning and the interpretation of the body. The sum total of all our actions. And now we're going to see the application having pure motives, proper intention, clear, holy desires. And with those motives, intentions, desires, because the desire, the inward man, the spirit, the heart is well in the grace of God, saved, sanctified. Having an intention, a motive that is according to the will, the word of God. Now, we're able to behave the way believers ought to behave. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore then I be single, sound, wholesome, healthy, thy body shall be full of light and look at that same passage in luke chapter 11 luke chapter 11 we're looking at verse 34 luke chapter 11 verse 34 the light of the body is the eye therefore when thine eye is single the same word when thine eye is wholesome when thine eye is sound when thine eye is healthy when thine eye is clear, 2020 vision, bright eyesight. When thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, when your intention is evil, when your heart is evil, when the very source of your behavior, your action is evil, when your desires are evil and when your disposition inwardly is evil that's what he's saying when you do not see well and you cannot see the glory of god and you're like a blind man blind in the heart it says when your eye is evil thy body also is full of darkness take it therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness if thy whole body therefore be full of light having no part dark if your whole body then be full of light giving light to the actions of your hand giving light to the motions of your feet giving light to the thoughts of your heart giving light to the speech of your mouth giving light to the actions of your life in general giving light to your behavior the word of god moderating everything in your life that's what it means it says if the whole body therefore be full of light you're full of the light of the word of god every situation in your life you refer back to the word that brings light in your pathway if your whole body therefore be full of light having no padak the whole shall be full of light as when the bright shining of a candle does give the light single mindedness that's what he's talking about you're focused on the lord and then it says it means that when your eyes directed singly and steadily towards an object and that eye is sound healthy everything is clear everything is plain if the eye is not sound if the eye is not healthy everything is dim or dark the eye regulates the motion and the direction of the body walking through this world it's important to fix your eye your heart your affection on god and heaven in order to conduct yourself righteously your conduct will be steadily righteous and acceptable to god when your motives are pure and when you seek only the glory of God and the salvation of souls in all your actions. Having your eye, your face, single and unwavering. 
Searching your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Searching your face like a fleet. Fixed on the glory of God. Your actions and your conduct will be approved of God as done in the light. Then it says, your whole body shall be full of light. Then shall will you be walking in the light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. All that is all that is needful to direct the soul and the conduct is that the eye of faith be fixed on heaven. Your motive must be pure. Your motive must be focused on God's glory. Then will your life be holy, and your life will be acceptable in the sight. Of the Lord. And let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. Single mindedness. That your eye is single. Your heart is fixed. Focused on the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. From verse 5. Servants be obedient to them. That are your masters. According to the flesh. It's talking about, you know, the, the work we do, the life we live. Civil servants or professional people, you have directors, you have leaders. And it says in everything you do, servants, be obedient unto your, unto your masters according to the flesh. With fear and tremble and trembling in singleness of heart. That means good intention. Good purpose focused on the glory of God alone as unto Christ. Uh, do you ever think like that? Your place of work, do you ever think like that? Uh, you know, the people that are above you in leadership, in the community, as well as in the church. And then it says that you serve under those leaders as unto Christ, not with high service. As men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from their heart. Those are single minded people. Verse 7 with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. That everything you do, you say, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of Him that sent me. I receive not honor from men. But the honor that cometh from God only and us out to live. Then Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things. Obey in all things. Obey in all things. You know, if you're a real Christian, you, uh, the Bible does not encourage you, does not encourage us to carry placards when there's a problem in your company. The Bible does not encourage us to join, you know, the civil rights activists. So and so must go. No, we break everything that the Bible does not encourage that. And if you do that, you are sinning against the word of the Lord. We don't do it politically. We don't do it economically. And we don't do it in a kind of diplomatic way. We don't do it in any way. Because God knows the heart. And in the church, we don't do that. If you are not happy with something, you go to God in prayer. Your mind is on the glory of God. It's on the will of God. And you don't carry any invisible placard. And you don't step up rebellion. Then you don't have a single eye. And you don't instigate other people to riot. And to break down the whole temple. Because you are not happy with something. If you're a real child of God, your heart is focused on the glory of God. Even when it appears you are cheated. Even when it appears, you know, they didn't give you what you think is your right. You take it to the Lord in prayer. Servants obey in all things, your masters, according to the flesh. Not with high service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart. Fearing God. You don't allow money to take over your heart. And that's what happens to the people of the world. Because, you know, the morning, afternoon, and evening, they're only thinking about money. The love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after. They have erred from the face. And if you ever set your heart on money, it becomes the root of all evil. And then you do quite a lot of things and your eye will not be single. Your purpose in life is kind of deformed. 
and your desires are not unto the Lord alone. Your affection, your heart, your mind is not centered on the Lord only. You are thinking about money above God, above service. And that's not right in our country. Not, don't ever carry any placard. Well, those of, they don't understand. Their eyes of understanding are darkened. But we were enlightened. And it says, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with high service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, wholeheartedly. Not, you know, not in a moody way. You know, in a way that it doesn't communicate any service at all. You do it joyfully, enthusiastically, actually, with all your heart. That's a single-minded believer. His focus, his attention, his desire is only to please the Lord, not to please himself. It says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. I pray God will help us. Give me an headquarters. Amen. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, singleness of mind. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And they continue, they continue sent firstly daily, continue daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did each their meet with gladness and singleness of heart. With gladness and singleness of heart. They were happy with whatever portion came to them. No complaint, no murmuring. No tearing down of anything, no destruction of the system, no breaking down of the temple of God because you know I'm not happy. He is not happy. Why did they give me this? Why did he give me that? No. Well, singleness of mind. That's how they did it. Singleness of heart. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, see how the Bible is downright to the to the very bottom, to the very minimal scene. Even the eating and the drinking, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, anytime, anywhere, it says, do all to the glory of God. You are not seeking your own exaltation. You're not seeking your own satisfaction. You're not seeking your own convenience. You're seeking the glory of God. That's having. A single eye, single eye, your mind, your eye, your intention, your affection is focused on the Lord alone. Whether I'm happy or not happy, that doesn't, that's not the, that's not the point. The point is, is God happy? Is the work of God being done? Is the glory of God being revealed? Are souls being brought into the kingdom of God? And is the gospel spreading? Is Christ being exalted? If that's the case, then that's all right. That's all right. Your, your happiness, your satisfaction is not the matter. It's not the important thing. That you do everything to the glory, to the exaltation, to the honor of the Lord. Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit. Not seeking my own profit. No competition, not seeking my own profit. And there's nothing that's nothing like they didn't take me into consideration. If they didn't take me to then everything is going to crumble. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. That they may be saved. That that's all you want. God is glorified, Christ exalted, and souls are being saved. We're told in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife of being glory. If you have single eyes, single intention, and a focused attention to the Lord, that's exactly what we're going to do. Let nothing be done through strife of being glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You'll not run down other people. And you will not degrade, disgrace other people. You'll not talk behind, maligning, slandering. 
cutting down, crucifying, destroying other people. If you have a single eye, you know when you do that, when you cut down other people, slander them, align them, put them down, degrade them, disgrace them, dishonor them, abuse them, insult them. You're trying to put yourself up. You're trying to put other people down. Here is where you are. Here is where other people are. And instead of praying and going up so you can come to their level, instead of having love, affection, and serving other people so you can get up, other people are here, you are here, you are not willing to get up, you bring down other people so that you now can be above them. That's what he want to say. Don't do that. Have a single eye. A single intention, a focused intention that you don't want to destroy what other people are doing so that your own can be exalted. That's what the Lord is telling us so that you have a single eye, a single purpose, a single desire. You have the glory of God, the honor of God only at heart. That's what the Lord is saying. And he says you don't do anything through strife or through vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. Look up here for a moment. I said look up here for a moment. Do you know something that happens? Let's say for example, want to have a program. And it's a single program. And you are not single. How do you publicize it? How do you exalt it? How do you talk about it? If we want to have family program and you are married, uh -uh, then let's carry all the let's carry all the outlines and all the handbills and we paste it everywhere. My brother, why are you so zealous about this, publicizing this now? You know, I've been waiting for this for a long time. I am married and they want to talk about family seminar. Now there you are. That's what the Lord is saying. When it comes to other people, how do you react? How do you do it? Because it says over here, look not every man on his own things. Let's say we want to have women crusade. You are not a woman, you are a man. And then what do you do? You, do you deliberately plan another program? Now we are going to have, you know, night vigil at this time in our district. Why are you having night vigil at the same time? They're having women program. Look not every man on his own things. You see, when you have a single eye and your mind is set on just glorifying God, you don't put down other people. Then when, whenever it is, we're going to have a youth program. Ah, now, all those youth workers, it's like, it's, where have they been before? Now you see activity here and there, and we're all up and doing, excited and happy, enthusiastic. And we paste this one here, paste this one here. When we're doing all the other programs, where were you? You're only interested in this one. And then we come to the campus program. Now it is campus. We're going to have this campus program. And then here is a handbill. We bring our personal money out. And we print extra. And we put it everywhere. And we use our initiative. And use our mind. Everything we've got. Go to the radio. Go to television. Announce it everywhere. And we give the coordinator the announcement. to uh, you know, Announce it for us. We're having campus uh, something. And the pastor will be there himself. Tell the people you didn't do it right tell them once again at the end of the service now there were some people that were not in the service when you made the announcement do it again there you are and it says look not every man on his own scene just love the lord and whether it's for women it's for the youth it's for the singles it's for the married it's for the campus it's for the children put your life into it and say this is daddy's business my father's business. And it's going to be done. That's the singular we're talking about. It's not just, you know, this kind of service that people have that is sectionalized. That the only zealous 
only enthusiastic when it comes to their own area and then it says let this man be in you which was also in Christ in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself as Christ as the king of kings and the God of the Lord of glory he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death of if unto death even the death of the cross in verse 14 do all things without murmurings and disputings do all things without murmurings and disputing as a single eye a single intention a desire to really serve the lord without any reservation that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that i may rejoice in the day of christ that have not run in vain neither labored in vain will not labor in vain give me a good amen we come to point number three now perverted minds were self-centered behavior perverted minds perverted minds or self-centered behavior let's come back to matthew chapter 6 we're now in verse 23 matthew chapter 6 we're looking at verse 23 but if thine eye be evil but if thine eye be evil thy whole body shall be full of darkness if your eye be dim or diseased or darkened or unhealthy if your eye be evil thy whole body shall be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness how great is that darkness when it says the evil eye what does that mean the evil eye the evil eye let's look at it it's talking about something moral by the way something spiritual deuteronomy chapter 15 deuteronomy chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 9 beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart saying the seventh year the year of release is at hand and thine eye be evil that's the evil eye and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother and thou givest him not that's the evil eye selfishness that's the evil eye self-centeredness that's the evil eye only thinking about yourself and not being considerate about your poor brother to give him something that he needs that's the evil eye and then it says and he cry unto the lord against thee and it be seen unto thee let's look at proverbs chapter 23 proverbs chapter 23 we're looking at it from verse 6 the evil eye and this is talking about about insincerity look at if if you are insincere then the lord says you have an evil eye look at it in proverbs chapter 23 verse 6 eat thou not the bread of him that has an evil eye eat not the bread of him that has an evil eye how do i know that he has an evil eye hey, look at it hey, go on it says neither desire thou his dirty meats for as a man thinketh in his heart so you see is the condition of his heart that's why we know he has an evil eye eat and drink says he to thee but his heart is not with thee that's an evil eyed man it seems sincere. Oh, he says, welcome. How I love you very much. I've been waiting for you. And you came at the right common nut. Let us eat together. And his heart is not with you. It doesn't mean you should eat with him. It's just teasing you. It's just pushing you forward. It's just watching, you know, the poor man, the hungry man. Let me see whether it's really going to. It's not sincere. That's an evil eye. Somebody who smiles, but he has hatred in the heart. Somebody who embraces you, but he has malice. And somebody who kisses you, like, Ju like the kings of Judas, but he's betraying you. And somebody who tries to be friendly in the open, but then is deadly 
in the back. That's an evil eye. It seems sincere. That's why it says in verse 8, The muscle that thou hast eaten, thou shalt vomit up and lose thy sweet words. All the sweet, sweet words they say, they are not sincere. Then we come to chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 25. When he speaketh fear, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. That's a man that has an evil eye. He speaks fear. He speaks nice. It's very, it's very friendly. Openly. And he goes about his smiles and laughs with everybody. But a very deadly man. Those are the people Jesus said they have sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Evil eye. Look at that verse 25 again. When you speak it, fear, believe me not. You know, it's, it's better to trust somebody that, that speaks his mind. When he's not happy, because you say, my friend, I'm not happy with this. This is not right. And then you're able to apologize. And then when he's something, something you just call you and say, my, my friend, look, this is wrong. When I'm going to have this, he, that's good. That's a plain person. That's somebody you can deal with because you know his mind, you know his heart. But a fellow that has hatred in the heart and is saying, he did that to me, I'll get him. And then when you see him, he says, I've been looking for you. I wanted to see you for a long time. Where have you been, my friend? And then you forget yourself and stabs you at the back. That's a man with an evil eye. He's not sincere. He's self-centered. He's carrying hatred in the heart. And yet, he's appearing friendly. Evil eye. And then it says, those people, they walk in moral darkness. Let's look at Matthew, uh, sorry, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 22. Proverbs 28 verse 22. He that hastes to be rich as an evil eye. He that hastes to be rich as an evil eye. That's covetousness. The one that has covetousness has an evil eye. And considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. And then we're told in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 now. I'm reading from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17, Ephesians 4, verse 17. It talks about this, I said, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that henceforth ye walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. The eye of the understanding is darkened. There's no light of the world. They are not sincere. They are not honest. They are not open. They are not transparent. Everything they do is hypocritical. And you cannot depend upon them being alienated from the life of God. Through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their hearts. Actually God looks at that. Do you know that our actions are weighed in the balances of God? He doesn't just look at what we do. He looks at the motive behind what we do. He doesn't just look at what we say. He looks at the reason, at the motive, the intention behind what we say. He doesn't just look at the action, but he looks at the sin beneath the action. The motive, the intention, the desire, the purpose, the reason for that action. Look at for Samuel chapter 2. For Samuel chapter 2. You cannot, you cannot evaluate somebody totally, completely by what he does. You have to look at his intention, at his purpose at his goal you, you look at first samuel chapter 2 verse 3 talk no more exceeding proudly let not arrogancy come out of your mouth for the lord is a god of knowledge and by him actions are waged by him actions are waged and look up here for a moment that's why you know sometimes you'll find in the word of god Somebody does something like this. And a person does something very similar to what that other fellow has done. This other one, the Lord says, okay, don't do that again. Just go away. This other one, the Lord judges him severely. He said, I don't understand. Because these two actions, they look similar. 
And yet, this one is almost like just a little warning. This one is very heavy. It's because those actions are not in isolation. It's the motive behind the action. It's the source of that action. It's the disposition. And that's why it says, God weighs the actions. And it's because of the motive behind it. And it is because the reason behind it is because of the intention behind it. That's why, you know, God does what it. Let me just show you some examples. In Second Chronicles chapter 25. Second Chronicles chapter 25, he weighs the actions and he looks at, he looks at uh, you know, the motive, the intention, the desire, the goal, the aim that made you to do what you did. Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 2. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You see what God was saying? If you look at it superficially, if you look at it on the surface, this is right. This is all right. Who can condemn this? But then it says, but not with a perfect heart. Until you look at Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said unto him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thine heart? And Jehonadab answered it is, If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand. And he took him up into the, into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride on his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he, he slew all, the, all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria. Till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which is spake by Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together now this is very important now we're looking at the action on top on the surface then we're looking at the intention at the motive it's not just what you do it's the motive that god is looking at you know you might just do something and smile and say i did it well maybe you did it well superficially how about the eye the intention the heart the affection the reason the motive that made you to do what you did verse 18 and jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them he have served a little but jehu shall serve him much he told the people he said you know Ahab that came before me as a king is sub Baal, but that's just little. Look at me here. I'm going to sub Baal much. He didn't mean that. Look at what therefore now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, all his priests, and let none be wanting. For I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not leave. But Jehu did it subtly to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. You see that? But Elijah also destroyed the worshippers of Baal. Don't you remember? Elijah came before the people and he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. That's direct. And if Baal, serve him. You know, Elijah's method was direct. And then he said, Let all the worshippers of Baal come. Give us a bullock. Let them slay their bullock. I will slay my bullock. And the God that brings fire down that, let him be the God. They said, you have said right. And then he told them, you are 450. Sacrifice the animal. And they did. He said, call on your God on Baal. And then they called and called and there was no fire. And then Elijah came and said, hold it. At the time of the evening sacrifice. That's direct. Everybody knew where Elijah was. You see, the motive is not just your action. And then he said, Come near unto me. And then he repaired the altar of the Lord. He set the wood in order. And he said, Fill four barrels of water and pour it in the pot. Second time, third time. And then he said, Oh Lord, hear me. That these people may know that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then the fire fell. And the people said, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. And he said, Don't let them escape. Take all of them together. Kill them. Elijah did the same thing but you know he was direct 
Everybody knew where he was going. Everybody knew his intention. His intention was to destroy the worshippers of Baal. And he called the whole nation and said, this is what I'm doing. But look at Jehu. He wanted to destroy them. Uh, but look at the method. Look at the motive. Look, look at the intention. Look at the way he did it. That's what we're saying. You know, the actions may look similar. Jehu did this. Elijah did this. But look at the thing behind the curtain. And then it goes on now. It says in verse, in verse 20. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And he proclaimed it. And Jehu said, through all Israel and all the worshippers of Baal came. So that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was full from one, from one end to another. And he said unto, unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth the vestments for all. All the worshippers of Baal, and he brought them. Uh, he brought forth the vestments, and Jehu went and Jonadab the son of Rechab into the house of Baal, and said to the worshippers of Baal, "Search and look that there be not that, that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord for the worshippers, but the worshippers of Baal only." And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed first come men without, and said, "If any of the men whom are brought into your hands escape he that letteth him go his life shall be for it shall shall be for the life of him and it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of offering the bond offering jehu said unto the god unto the captains go in and slay them let none come forth you see that he killed them but look at the method and he didn't know his intent. You don't know the intentions of people. You might say, this is similar to what Elijah did. But look at the method, the motive, the desire. Look at the, look at the comment on, Je on Jehu now in verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He didn't have a single heart. A sound eye. He held the eye. You know, it was like this, very diplomatic, self-centered, even satanic in that approach. But you know, when you are very sincere, single eye, sound eye, a good intention, a good motive, and people know this is where you are. We know what you believe, we know what you stand for. But somebody you can never tell when he's going to the right, his mind is actually going to the left. It says, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. It's like, look at this in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're looking at you from verse 4. John chapter 12 verse 4. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pairs and given to the poor? Look at that statement. That's a wonderful statement. Let's sell this ointment. Don't just spoil it away like that. And then we, we, can, we can minister to the poor. Well, these were the price of this ointment. And that's a normal state, a good statement on the surface. But look at the intention. Look at the intention. It's the intention that matters. It's the motive that matters. That's what Jesus is saying. The light of the body is the eye. And if your eye be single, if your intention be right, then your whole body or your actions will be full of light. But if your eye be evil, if you have a bad intention, a bad motive, and a wrong desire, then your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Look at Judas Iscariot as if he cared for the poor on the surface. But says, this is said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and at the bag and bear what was put therein. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 15. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ. If you stop there, that's a wonderful thing. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And Paul, the apostle said, yes, I hear them preaching, but think about their motive. Think about their intention. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strive. Others, some also of goodwill. They won't preach Christ of contention, and, but not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. The two camps were preaching Christ. This one is preaching Christ. That one is preaching Christ. If you look at what both of them do on the surface, they look all right. They look, is this what to do? Preaching, preaching Christ. But one was doing it of envy. One was doing it of contention. One was doing it with an ulterior motive. That's what the Lord is saying. If you want to do good, you do it with a good intention, a good heart, a good understanding. I have a single eye, a purpose that wants the glory and the glory of the Lord alone. But then, you know, you can say, I'm preaching Christ, I'm preaching Christ. What's your intention? What's your purpose for doing what you do? What's your desire? What are you trying to get out of what you are doing? That's what the Lord is saying. The intention, the motive, the desire. Come back to that uh, verse, uh, to that verse 16. They won't preach Christ of contention, but not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Hosea chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 2. Hosea chapter 10, we're looking at verse 2. Here the Lord again is referring to the condition of the heart in everything you do. Everything you do, everywhere you go, everything you say, all the actions of your life, the actions of your body. Everything the Lord wants to see. What is your intention? In Hosea chapter 10, we're looking at verse 2. Hosea chapter 10 verse 2. Here it says... Their heart is divided, now shall they be found faulty. Their heart is divided. They're not single, they're not straightforward, they're not focused, they're not fixed on the glory of God. And it says because their heart is divided, no matter what they do, it will look good on the surface, but it says they'll be found faulty. What do we do now? Oh, what's the conclusion of this whole thing? Come to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. We're looking at it from verse 7. Psalm 57, verse 7. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. It says, Oh Lord, now I understand. My heart is fixed on your glory, on the exaltation of Christ, on the obedience and fulfillment of your word. No more self, no more personal desire. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. Psalm 108, Psalm 108. We're looking at verse 1. Oh God. God, my heart is fixed. Now I understand. It's the matter of the heart. It's not just the action. It's not just the motions of the leg, the activities of the hand, or the speech of the mouth, or the hearing of the ear, or the ministry that we do. It's the condition of the heart. Oh God, my heart is fixed. Psalm 112, I'm reading verse 7. Psalm 112, verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And that's what the Lord is calling us. So the Lord is telling us to examine our intention, our motive, our desires, our affection. And then he's telling us to set our affections on high, on the things of the Lord, not on the things on the earth. It is that intention, that purpose of heart. It is a fixed purpose that then gives real quality, spiritual quality to everything that we do. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Don't be motivated by pride, by jealousy, by envy, by vainglory. Don't be motivated by strife. But it says, since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is seated on the right hand of God, set your affection 
set your affection. It's like when you set your watch, set your watch, and let your watch be the same time with the one on the tower. Set your affection. Let it be the same mind of Christ, the same attitude of Christ, the same intention of Christ, the same purpose of Christ. Then will you have a single eye, sound eye, wholesome eye, and then you'll be able to see and focus on heavenly things in everything you do. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. On, on the, earth. the Lord is telling us then, uh, reminding us that the light of the body is is the eye and he wants our eye to be single our intention to be focused on the glory of god and he says if your eye is single your whole body will be full of light and from the light of the gospel here then you go to the light of glory let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer that the lord will help us Rise up and talk to the Lord. That you move on. No darkness here. No bad intention here. You move from here. Then you move on to the light of the glory of God. Examine your heart. The purpose of coming to the Bible study is to see our imperfections and then be cleansed from all our imperfections. The purpose of coming to the Bible study is to see our infirmities, our frailties, our shortcoming, our sins, if we have sinned, our backsliding, if we are backsliding. And then to say, Lord, I come, that's the purpose to present every man perfect in the sight of the Almighty God. And you're asking the Lord, then, oh Lord, here am I, here am I. Take the imperfections away, the wrong motives chief take it away the wrong intention take it away the pride in there take it away the vain glory take it away the strife take it away the envy the jealousy take it away and the self-centeredness take it away so that my heart my mind my will will be focused on the almighty god alone that's what the lord is calling us to and let your eye be single let your purpose be straightforward that only the glory of god only the honor of god is what interests you if you are backsliding, you tell the Lord, oh Lord, through strife are backsliding, through vain glory are backsliding, and through contention are backsliding, and through fighting are backsliding, and through this covetousness, self-centeredness are backsliding. Then you say, Lord, I'm coming back. My heart is fixed now. My heart is fixed on the glory of God. My heart is fixed on wanting to serve the Lord without any wrong intention. All the actions of my life, everything I do, I want you to exalt Christ. So glorify God and to get souls saved. I don't want to be a hindrance to the souls that ought to get saved. You tell the Lord to give you this pure intention, this pure motive, this right intention, so that your life will be according to the very delight of the Almighty God. You're not looking for personal satisfaction. All you want is satisfaction of the Lord. Only the glory of the Lord, the honor of the Lord, the exaltation of Christ, and not your own glory glory not your own exaltation not your own ex not your own edification alone but you want you want you want the exaltation of christ in everything you do every word you speak every motion of your feet every action every activity of your hands every speech of your mouth every interaction of, re of your relationship you want god and god and god alone to be glorified why don't you tell the lord this real christianity otherwise you might just have this superficial action of jehu and it looks like what Elijah did. It looks like you think you are doing the right thing. But the intention is wrong. But the motive is wrong. And, and the method is wrong. And you are not sincerely worshipping the Lord. And the Lord knows your heart by him. Actions are waged. By him actions are waged. By him actions are waged. You understand? You understand your own life. You understand your own intention. You understand your own motive. And the Lord is weighing your action. The Lord is weighing. Is looking at everything you do. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Are you sinful at heart? And satanic at heart? Backsliding at heart? And yet it appears that you, you know you have the right action. And the right word. And the right appearance. And yet in your heart. In your heart. In your heart. In your 
motive in your intention you, you're upside down you're upside down you're not really seeking the glory of god why don't you tell the lord oh lord i want pure christianity pure christianity i want pure christianity with right intention with right motive and with the right desire oh lord help me and the lord will help you that's that's the real basis of serving the lord that's the real basis of serving the lord and it is not that you know when it's a program that you know will kind of help your own area of work you're all excited and all enthused and you know you give everything up and then when it's a program that you know you are not a worker in that area then you're not interested hey, that's not christianity that's not christianity whether it is youth program or women program is to save souls and whether it is a bachelor's a program or spinster's program is to make people to know the lord is to bring the blessing of god to their lives if you are a real child of god you'll not be taking sides i'm not sure you know you're not contributing to that you're not having any part in, you're even hindering that one because it's not your area that's not christianity that's not christianity if you were doing it and your friends were doing it and your group was doing it ah you'll all be excited you'll all be excited here let us go with it you sacrifice but then when it's other people how do you do how do you do how do you act how do you act self centeredness and selfishness but you are calling upon the lord saying oh lord help me let me have real christianity real christianity that will not be this a kind of jehu kind of of worship deceitful deceitful not like Judas Iscariot. Why don't we sell this and give the money to the poor? And yet he's only caring about having enough to steal. But you want to serve the Lord with pure purpose, pure intention, pure desire, with a single eye, sound eye, a pure motive, right intention affection in your heart loving the lord your god with all your heart all your soul all your mind and all your strength and loving your neighbor as yourself not this tribal kind of thing and not this sectional kind of thing that's not that's not of god are you not doing what you're doing for the love of money the love of money slandering other people cutting down other people destroying other people even wanting to break down and to demolish the whole building wanting to pull down the whole temple because you're not uh, you're not happy that's not christianity christianity will say what i'm happy or not that's not the issue i want god to be happy i want god to be exalted i want christ to be glorified and i want him to be honored that's christianity that in your heart you are not putting yourself first you're putting god first god first if god is honored that's all i want god be honored god be honored jesus be honored in everything i do in my life every day and that's what it means a single eye a single eye a singular a pure motive serving the lord without insincerity without covetousness without self-centeredness but serving the lord with all your heart all your soul and all your mind saying oh lord here am i here am i examine me examine me search my heart oh god and see what's in my heart if there be any wicked way in me cleanse me from every, th every thought purify me and let me go in the right direction Yes, it can make your heart pure, your intention pure, your motive pure. And then you'll be able to walk in the right direction, saved, free from sin, and free from self-centeredness, free from selfishness, free and free indeed. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The sacrifice of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing and washing you, making you free, free to serve the Lord, exalting only the glory of the Lord, not your own glory. You're not seeking exaltation. You're not full of pride. Be closed with humility, every one of you. And all you want is that God be glorified, souls be saved. The church be edified and the church grow and then you're willing to sacrifice for that 
They may not mention your name. They may not uh, put you in a special place. They may not give you special recognition. But you want the name of the Lord to be glorified and sinners to be saved and the believers to grow in grace. A single eye. A single eye. A pure motive. Right intention. Good desires. That you live for God and for God alone in your life. You forget yourself. You allow Jesus to sit on the throne as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then you, you are the submissive, humble servant of the Lord.